a Wikividi Documentaries production. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Enjoy. O.J. Simpson Murder Case The O.J. Simpson murder case was a criminal trial held at the Los Angeles County Superior Court in which former National Football League player, broadcaster, and actor Oren Thal James, O. J. Simpson was tried on two counts of murder for the June 12, 1994. Deaths of his ex-wife Nicole Brown Simpson and Mezzaluna restaurant waiter Ronald Goldman. The trial spanned 11 months, from the jury's swearing in on November 9, 1994. Opening statements were made on January 24, 1995, and the verdict was announced on October 3, 1995, when Simpson was declared not guilty of murder on both counts. Following Simpson's acquittal, no additional arrests or convictions related to the murders have been made. According to the newspaper USA Today, the case has been described as the most publicized criminal trial in history. Moreover, the Simpson trial is most commonly known as the trial of the century. Simpson was represented by a very high-profile defense team also referred to as the Dream Team, which was initially led by Robert Shapiro and subsequently directed by Johnny Cochran. The team also included F. Lee Bailey, Alan Urshavitz, Robert Kardashian, Sean Holly, Carly Douglas, and Gerald Emin. Barry Sheck and Peter Neufeld were two additional attorneys who specialized in DNA evidence. Deputy District Attorneys Marcia Clark and Christopher Darden believed they had a strong case against Simpson, but Cochran was able to convince the jurors that there was reason to doubt the DNA evidence provided by the state, which was a relatively new form of evidence in trials at that time. The reasonable doubt theory included evidence that the blood sample had allegedly been mishandled by lab scientists and technicians, and there were questionable circumstances that surrounded other court exhibits. Cochran and the defense team also alleged other misconduct by the Los Angeles Police Department, related to systemic racism and the actions of Detective Mark Furman. Simpson's celebrity status, racial issues, and the lengthy televised trial riveted national attention on the so-called trial of the century. By the end of the criminal trial, national surveys show dramatic differences in the assessment of Simpson's guilt or innocence between black and white Americans. After the criminal trial, the Brown and Goldman families filed a civil lawsuit against Simpson. On February 4, 1997, the jury unanimously found Simpson responsible for both deaths. The families were awarded compensatory and punitive damages totaling $33.5 million, but have received only a small portion of that. Brown Simpson Marriage Nicole Brown and O.J. Simpson were married on February 2, 1985. Five years after his retirement from professional football, the couple had two children, Sidney Brooke Simpson and Justin Ryan Simpson. Their marriage lasted seven years, during which time Simpson was investigated by police for domestic violence multiple times and pleaded no contest to spousal abuse in 1989. Brown filed for divorce on February 25, 1992, citing irreconcilable differences. Still. The abuse continued. Brown called 911 on the 25th of October 1993, crying and saying that Simpson is going to beat the shit out of me. Before the murder trial, Nicole had called the police on Simpson eight times in total. Murders. At 12:10 a.m. on June 13, 1994, Nicole Brown Simpson and Ronald Goldman were found murdered outside of Nicole's Bundy Drive condominium in the Brentwood area of Los Angeles. Brown had been stabbed multiple times in her head and neck, and had defensive wounds on her hands. The larynx could be seen through the gaping wound in her neck, and vertebra C3 was incised. Her head remained barely attached to the body. Both victims had been dead for about two hours prior to being discovered by police. Robert Risk, one of the first two officers on the scene, found a single bloody glove, among other evidence. Detectives went to Simpson's Rockingham estate to inform him that his ex-wife had been murdered in the back of his home. They found some blood scattered all over on a white Ford Bronco. Detective Mark Furman climbed over an external wall and unlocked the gate to allow the other three detectives to enter as well. The detectives argued that they entered without a search warrant, because of exigent circumstances, specifically, in this case, out of fear that Simpson might have been injured also. Simpson was not present when the detectives arrived early that morning. 
He had taken a flight to Chicago late the previous night. Detectives briefly interviewed Kato Kellen, who was staying in Simpson's guest house. In a walk around of the premises, Furman discovered a second bloody glove. It was later determined to be the match of the glove found at the murder scene. Through DNA testing, the blood on this one was determined to have come from both victims. This, together with other evidence collected at both scenes, was determined to be probable cause to issue an arrest warrant for Simpson. Arrest of Simpson Lawyers convinced LAPD to allow Simpson to turn himself in at 11 a.m. on June 17, 1994. Although the double murder charge meant that no bail would be set and a first-degree murder conviction could result in a death penalty. More than 1,000 reporters waited for Simpson at the police station, but he did not arrive. At 2 p.m. LAPD issued an all-points bulletin. At 5 p.m., Robert Kardashian, a friend of Simpson's and one of his defense lawyers, read a letter by Simpson to the media. In the letter Simpson sent greetings to 24 friends and wrote, First everyone understand I had nothing to do with Nicole's murder. Don't feel sorry for me. I've had a great life. Some interpreted this as a suicide note. Simpson's mother Eunice collapsed after hearing it, and reporters joined the search for Simpson. Simpson's lawyer Robert Shapiro was present at Kardashian's press conference and said that Simpson's psychiatrists agreed. With the suicide note interpretation, over the television, Shapiro appealed to Simpson to surrender. At around 6.20 p.m., a motorist in Orange County notified police after seeing Simpson riding in a white Ford Bronco that was being driven by his longtime friend Al Cowlings. The police tracked calls placed from Simpson on his cell phone. At 6.45 p.m., police officer Ruth Dixon saw the Bronco head north on Interstate 405. When she caught up to it, Cowlings yelled out that Simpson was in the back seat of the vehicle and had a gun to his own head. The officer backed off but followed the vehicle at 35 miles per hour, with up to 20 police cars following her in the chase. More than nine helicopters eventually joined the pursuit. The high degree of media participation caused camera signals to appear on incorrect television channels. The chase was so long that one helicopter ran out of fuel, forcing its station to ask another for a camera feed. Radio station KNX also provided live coverage of the low-speed pursuit. USC Sports announcer Peter Arbogast and station producer Cash Limbark contacted former USC coach John Mackay to go on the air and encourage Simpson to end the pursuit. Mackay agreed and asked Simpson to pull over and turn himself in instead of committing suicide. My God, we love you, Juice. Just pull over and I'll come out and stand by you all the rest of my life, he promised. LAPD detective Tom Lang who had previously interviewed Simpson about the murders on June 13, realized that he had Simpson's cellular phone number and called him repeatedly. A colleague hooked a tape recorder up to Lang's phone and captured a conversation between Lang and Simpson in which Lang repeatedly pleaded with Simpson to throw the gun out of the window for the sake of his mother and children. Simpson apologized for not turning himself in earlier that day and responded that he was the only one who deserved to get hurt and was, just gonna go, with Nicole. Cowling's voice is overheard in the recording pleading with Simpson to surrender and end the chase peacefully. During the pursuit, and without having a chance to hear the taped phone conversation, Simpson's friend Al Michaels interpreted his actions as an admission of guilt. All big three television networks and CNN, as well as local news outlets, interrupted regularly scheduled programming to cover the incident with an estimated 95 million viewers nationwide. Only 90 million had watched that year's Super Bowl, while NBC continued coverage of Game 5 of the NBA Finals between the New York Knicks and the Houston Rockets at Madison Square Garden. The game appeared in a small box in the corner while Tom Brokaw as anchorman covered the chase. The chase was covered live by ABC News anchors Peter Jennings and Barbara Walters on behalf of ABC's five news magazines which achieved some of their highest ever ratings that week. Benefiting from the event occurring in the evening, Domino's Pizza stated that its pizza delivery sales during the televised chase were as large as on Super Bowl Sunday. Thousands of spectators and onlookers packed overpasses along the procession's journey waiting for the white Bronco. In a festival-like atmosphere, many had signs urging Simpson to flee. They and the millions watching the chase on television felt part of a common emotional experience. One author wrote, 
as they wonder red if O.J. Simpson would commit suicide, escape, be arrested, or engage in some kind of violent confrontation. Whatever might ensue, the shared adventure gave millions of viewers a vested interest, a sense of participation, a feeling of being on the inside of a national drama in the making. Sports Illustrated later commented the chase and subsequent hoopla was the Sugarland Express meets the fugitive. Simpson reportedly demanded that he be allowed to speak to his mother before he would surrender. The chase ended at 8 p.m. at his Brentwood home, 50 miles later, where his son, Jason, ran out of the house, gesturing wildly, and 27 SWAT officers awaited. After remaining in the Bronco for about 45 minutes, Simpson was allowed to go inside for about an hour. A police spokesman stated that he spoke to his mother and drank a glass of orange juice, causing reporters to laugh. Shapiro arrived, and Simpson surrendered to authorities a few minutes later. In the Bronco the police found $8,000 in cash, a change of clothing, a loaded dot .357 Magnum, a passport, family pictures, and a fake goatee and moustache. Neither the footage of the Bronco chase nor the items found in the Bronco were shown to the jury as evidence in the trial. As Simpson was driven away, he saw the crowds, many of whom were African Americans, cheering him. Simpson said, What are all these niggers doing in Brentwood? Trial On June 20, Simpson was arraigned and pleaded not guilty to both murders. As expected, the presiding judge ordered that Simpson be held without bail. The following day, a grand jury was called to determine whether to indict him. For the two murders, Two days later on June 23, the grand jury was dismissed as a result of excessive media coverage, which could have influenced its neutrality. Jill Shively, a Brentwood resident who testified that she saw Simpson speeding away from the area of Nicole's house on the night of the murders, told the grand jury that the Bronco almost collided with a Nissan at the intersection of Bondi and San Vicente Boulevard. Another grand jury witness, Jose Camacho, was a knife salesman at Ross Cutlery. He said he had sold Simpson a 15-inch German-made knife, similar to the murder weapon. Three weeks before the killings, Shively and Camacho were not presented by the prosecution at the criminal trial, because they had sold their stories to the tabloid press. Shively had talked to the television show Hard Copy for $5,000, and Camacho sold his story to the National Enquirer for $12,500, rather than a grand jury hearing. Authorities held a probable cause hearing to determine whether or not to bring Simpson to trial. This was a minor victory for Simpson's lawyers, because it would give them access to evidence as it was being presented by the prosecution in contrast to procedure in a grand jury hearing. After a week-long court hearing, California Superior Court Judge Kathleen Kennedy Powell ruled on July 7 that there was sufficient evidence to bring Simpson to trial for the murders. At his second arraignment on July 22, when asked how he pleaded to the murders, Simpson, breaking a courtroom practice that says the accused may plead using only the words, guilty, or, not guilty, firmly stated, absolutely, 100%, not guilty. District Attorney Gil Garcetti elected to file charges in downtown Los Angeles, as opposed to Santa Monica, where the crime took place. The decision would prove to be highly controversial, especially after Simpson was acquitted. It likely resulted in a jury pool with more Latinos, blacks, Asian Americans, and blue-collar workers than would have been found from Santa Monica. Veteran LAPD detective Tom Lang led the murder investigation. The prosecution decided not to seek the death penalty, and instead sought a life sentence. The TV exposure made celebrities of many of the figures in the trial, including the presiding judge. Lance Ito, Deputy District Attorney Marcia Clark was designated as the lead prosecutor. Deputy District Attorney Christopher A. Darden became Clark's co-counsel. Simpson wanted a speedy trial, and the defense and prosecuting attorneys worked around the clock for several months to prepare their cases. In October 1994, Judge Ito started interviewing 304 prospective jurors, each of whom had to fill out a 75-page questionnaire. On November 3, 12th jurors were seated with 12 alternates. 
The trial began on January 24, 1995 and was televised by Court TV and in part by other cable and network news outlets for 134 days. Los Angeles County Prosecutor Christopher Darden argued that Simpson killed his ex-wife in a jealous rage. The prosecution opened its case by playing a 911 call from Nicole Brown Simpson on January 1, 1989. She expressed fear that Simpson would physically harm her, and he could be heard yelling at her in the background. Other material related to domestic violence was presented. The prosecution also presented dozens of expert witnesses to place Simpson at the scene of the crime, on subjects ranging from DNA profiling, to blood and shoe print analysis. During the opening weeks of the trial, the prosecution presented evidence that Simpson had a history of physically abusing Nicole. Simpson's lawyer Alan Dershowitz argued that only a tiny fraction of women who are abused by their mates are murdered. Within days after the start of the trial, lawyers and those viewing the trial from a single closed-circuit TV camera in the courtroom saw an emerging pattern continual and countless interruptions with objections from both sides of the courtroom, as well as one sidebar conference after another with the judge. Beyond earshot of the unseen jury located just below and out of the camera's frame. Brought to you by Wikivideo Documentaries. Would you like to know more?